Awesome. Thank you, Meg, for that introduction. Uh, really excited to be here. Um, my topic today is review of the chest pain guidelines. This is by no means an exhaustive review because that would take quite some time. More so just uh, a glance at some of the most practice changing portions of the guidelines that affect us. So with that being said, disclosures, there are none. I have no disclosures. And objectives for today. So as previously mentioned, this is a review of the fairly new guidelines that have been released, the 2021 AHA ACC guidelines for the evaluation and diagnosis of chest pain. I will be focusing on patients with acute chest pain who are presenting in the emergency department with and without known CAD and how we should be managing these patients. Um, and also in the outpatient setting, also uh, for folks who have known and um, not known history of CAD. So let's proceed. Um, first, let's start with some general housekeeping. Uh, there have been some changes with uh, regards to the nomenclature and classification of chest pain that were specifically discussed during these guidelines. So um, what they recommended is that chest pain should no longer be described as typical versus atypical. Instead, we should refer to uh, chest pain as cardiac, possible cardiac, or non-cardiac. And the reason that they uh, give for this is that atypical can often be misinterpreted to mean some type of benign cause. And that certainly is not true because we know that a pneumothorax or a PE, although it can present with atypical chest pain, is, is quite serious. Um, instead, terms such as cardiac, possible cardiac, and non-cardiac are more specific to the potential underlying cause of this patient's chest pain. So chest pains, um, the graphics for these new guidelines were just so snazzy, I couldn't, I couldn't resist myself. They, they truly went all out. Um, so that being said, let's start with evaluating acute chest pain in the emergency department. So I really like this figure um, because it highlights the most common causes of chest pain in the ED. So uh, our initial thoughts uh, for a patient presenting with acute chest pain in the emergency department um, is essentially, is the patient's chest pain due to coronary artery disease? And is this coronary artery disease significant enough that it's causing this pain? So here we see that over 50% of patients um, varying across the different age categories, all uh, ultimately have some type of non-cardiac cause of their chest pain, which is pretty significant because I feel like chest pain is one of the most common chief complaints that we see in the emergency department. Um, the other thing to highlight uh, where the arrows are is that we see in this graph that as the patient's age increases, CAD as a cause of chest pain also increases, and it's not even found in the age category of 18 to 44, which should kind of help our pretest probability when assessing patients in this particular category for CAD as a cause of their chest pain. Nevertheless, about 5.1% of patients in the emergency department will have ACS, and these are the patients that we worry about missing. So, Let's uh, talk about the initial evaluation in the emergency department. So I think we all do a wonderful job of this, starting with the history and physical exam. Um, I really like this uh, graphic as well because it highlights some of the key features that should increase your pretest probability based on history and physical exam for potential CAD and ischemia. And things like sharp and fleeting pleuritic positional pain is a lower pretest probability for ischemia. Um, one thing to mention is that relief with nitroglycerin is not necessarily diagnostic of myocardial ischemia and should not be used as a diagnostic criteria, especially because other entities demonstrate comparable responses. For example, esophageal spasm will also improve if you give someone nitrates. And some physical exam findings. Um, honestly, uh, the physical exam often for people who have CAD can be quite normal in uncomplicated cases, but you know, if someone is having ACS, diaphoresis, tachypnea, tachycardia, hypotension, new crackles, S3, things like that. So initial evaluation in the ED, the uh, chest pain guidelines made some recommendations as far as what the initial evaluation should be. Um, we, we all do a great job uh, at ordering this uh, workup. So an ECG within 10 minutes of arrival, 
uh, chest x-ray to look for other non-cardiac causes of chest pain and a high sensitivity cardiac troponin is preferred. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, with regards to the EKG, um, in patients who's, uh, who are having chest pain, whose initial EKG is non-diagnostic, um, they should have serial EKGs performed to detect any possible ischemic changes, especially if their clinical suspicion is high, if their symptoms persist, or if they deteriorate clinically. Um, now, I found it very interesting that the guidelines specifically made a distinction between high sensitivity cardiac troponin and non-high sensitivity cardiac troponin assays. And that kind of took me down a rabbit hole and made me ask myself, well, what assay do we use as an institution at the University of Washington? So let's take a look. I'll start off by looking at the recommendations that were made by the uh, new chest pain guidelines. And here, as I previously mentioned, they point out that a high sensitivity cardiac troponin is a preferred biomarker. And um, they also recommended that clinicians should be familiar with the analytical performance and the 99th percentile upper reference limit of normal to detect myocardial injury at their specific institution. And so I was like, Oh boy, oh boy, I ordered a troponin like hundreds of times and not once did I ever think to like check what assay we were running, what the 99th percentile upper limit of our reference limit was. And so I went to the UW Medicine, uh, lab medicine website to kind of get some further information. And this is what they provided. So per the UW lab medicine, values over 99th percentile um, suggestive of myocardial injury for us is greater than 0 0.03 micrograms per liter. Um, and the keyword here is myocardial injury, so not an infarction. And as we know, there are many causes of cardiac injury, such as a heart failure exacerbation, uh, pulmonary embolism, uh, sepsis, myopericarditis, the list goes on. The other possible um, kind of uh, uh, value that you can get are troponins, which are greater than 0 0.04 um, and 0 0.4. And so when you get troponins in this value range, this is when you're thinking about measuring uh, serial cardiac troponins, specifically because you're trying to ascertain what that trend is going to be and match it to what you're seeing clinically with regards to your patients. Um, so the interesting part about this is that you can repeat these troponins within one to three hours because they are so sensitive. You no longer have to wait six to eight hours to get a delta troponin with these new high sensitivity assays. And that just kind of like blew my mind, um, especially when thinking about prior stints through the emergency department, you can actually go through your process of ruling out ACS, for instance, much quicker. And lastly, the other value that you can get is a cardiac troponin greater than 0.4. And this is highly suggestive of an underlying cardiac injury, typically a myocardial infarction. And so I found this really helpful as far as giving me a framework for how to interpret troponins and just kind of be more confident with regards to what I'm seeing uh, when this lab test comes back. Okay, so algorithm for acute chest pain in the emergency department. Uh, these are often like very convoluted, but uh, this one is not that bad. So if you have a patient in the emergency department who's presenting with acute chest pain, as we previously stated, you start with your history and physical exam, you get a prompt EKG, and that EKG is going to give us a lot of information. But let's focus on this side of the graph, which is like, we think it might be possible ACS. We get our high sensitivity troponin, check. And then we use our CDP to risk stratify. So the chest pain guidelines place a lot of emphasis on these CDPs. And essentially what that stands for is a clinical decision pathway. And as an institution, we do really good at using these uh, clinical decision pathways to risk stratify our patients. So things such as the heart score, the grace score, Timmy. Based on this, we can risk stratify our patients into low, intermediate, and high risk. Um, and the reason why this matters is because compared with an unstructured clinical assessment, CDPs have been shown to decrease unnecessary testing and reduce admissions while also maintaining a high sensitivity and detection for acute myocardial injury and 30-day major adverse cardiac events. So let's just focus and look at patients with acute chest pain. 
who we think might be uh, low risk. There are basically two ways to go about placing a patient into a low risk category. One, you use your high sensitivity cardiac troponin. And then the other one, you use uh, a clinical decision-based pathway. So if you have the ability to do a high sensitivity cardiac troponin, which we do, um, and you get it, your initial troponin, um, and that is negative, so less than 0 0.03 for us, and their chest pain has been going on for three hours or more, then that test is like very sensitive and the negative predictive value is so uh, high that you can rest assured that you don't need to do any further testing. So that being said, the timing is crucial. Now, if the patient presents with chest pain that hasn't been ongoing for three hours or more, then this is when you can get your Delta troponin. And as previously stated, you don't need to wait six hours, four hours. You can get it within one to two hours to three hours. And still your negative predictive value is gonna be greater than 99% for 30 day MACE. So really fantastic. And your CDP paced pathways are basically gonna be scores like the heart score less than three with an initial negative um, uh, troponin. So ultimately, uh, the recommendation for low, low risk patients with acute chest pain, um, they can be discharged home um, and their 30 day like MACE risk is less than 1%. Um, and I think the biggest practice changing guideline with regards to this specific patient population is that um, there's no evidence that stress testing or cardiac imaging within 30 days of index ED visit improves their outcome. And this represents a change from previous guidelines where stress testing within 72 hours was broadly recommended for patients with acute chest pain. So we know now that that's no longer necessary. How about patients who land in this intermediate risk category? So once again, patients with acute chest pain without known history of CAD who are intermediate risk. Um, once again, you use your clinical decision pathway, uh, such as heart score. Basically, they're not low risk and they don't have high risk features either. That kind of lands them in that intermediate risk. You can perform a TTE. Basically, what you're looking for is any new evidence of ischemia, such as new wall motion abnormalities, uh, new decreased left ventricular function, things like that. The one thing I will say about this is that this is a recommendation for a formal study and not bedside ultrasound. So cannot use a POCUS uh, if you're not like a trained certified echo sonographer. So that's a caveat there. So what if you're unable to obtain a prompt TTE? This is where the guidelines really start to change and shift more to anatomical testing. So if a patient is intermediate risk, have acute chest pain and no known history of CAD, you can't get a TTE, that's when you can get a CTA, so a coronary CT angiography. Um, this is useful for the exclusion of atherosclerotic plaque and obstructive CAD. And once again, that's what these guidelines are here to answer. Is this patient's chest pain due to coronary artery disease? Are they at increased risk of acute myocardial injury and MACE? So, Anatomical versus functional testing. Um, we use our CDPs first, our clinical uh, decision pathways to risk stratify patients into low, intermediate, um, and high risk. And then based off of that, um, we can order a CCTA, uh, particularly if the patient's less than 65 years of age. Um, but ultimately a lot of this is driven by uh, local expertise and availability because not every single center has, has access to uh, coronary CT angiography or has a cardiologist who can interpret this. Um, that being said, in the emergency department um, where patients who are undergoing evaluation for acute chest pain, um, we have uh, studies now that show that CCTA contributes to reduced time to diagnosis and prompt discharge without impacting safety. So there's no difference in death, repeat ED visits or ACS over one in six month follow-up. And compared with standard evaluation, um, and this is compared with standard evaluation for stress testing. So overall, uh, CCTA resulted in improved efficiency and reduction in length of stay and prompt discharge. Uh, and it also results in cost savings from 15 to 38% with compared with standard care strategies. For example, if we compare it a CCTA to a stress MPI, that's a savings of like 15 to 38%, for instance. Um, ultimately, the takeaway here is that a CCTA can be faster, cheaper, and it's relatively safe. 
There's also this mention of a warranty period, which particularly pertains to patients who are in the intermediate risk category. And so this warranty period applies to prior cardiac testing and should be considered when symptoms are relatively unchanged. So if a patient had a recent CCTA or stress testing and is presenting with chest pain, um, and they're placed in the low intermediate risk and they're within these warranty periods, technically you don't always have to repeat this cardiac workup once again. You can feel fairly certain or uh, assured that something catastrophic isn't going on within their coronary arteries. So that was also really interesting to think about this warranty period. It's kind of an unusual way to phrase it, but kind of helpful. Cool. So in patients with intermediate risk with acute chest pain and known CAD, what do we do if we know that our patient has a history of coronary artery disease? Well, first thing we should start with is optimizing their GDMT. And if they come to you and you feel like they're on optimized GDMT and they're still having chest pain, then then that's once again where the shift in paradigm has moved from functional testing to anatomic testing. And you can consider a CCTA particularly to look for progression of atherosclerotic plaque and worsening obstructive CAD. Um, otherwise, you can also consider stress imaging, such as a stress echo, would also be very, very reasonable for patients with known CAD and acute chest pain. So looking through this algorithm for acute chest pain with uh, intermediate risk patients with known CAD, uh, the big changes are kind of on this side over here where you have non-obstructive CAD and acute chest pain. You can get a CCTA to look for worsening evidence of uh, atherosclerotic disease or progression. And then if there's no change, then you can discharge the patient. Um, that's crazy. However, if there's obstructive CAD greater than 50%, maybe the patient has had progression of uh, their uh, coronary artery disease, you can do stress testing, or you can add on this fancy test called FFRCT. And FFR stands for fractional flow reserve. It's this like special program that they use to construct, reconstruct the coronary arteries in like 3D model, and basically look at what the flow is compared to what the theoretical flow should be. And then they come up with this ratio. Um, so if you had less than 0.8 with one being normal, then that kind of indicates that you have moderate to severe ischemia, and then um, you would go to invasive coronary angiography. But if that value is greater than 0.8, then you can just continue to uptitrate GDMT and be able to discharge the patient. This other side is like still ha hasn't changed much, so we won't spend too much time on that. And lastly, if you see a patient who you deem to be high risk with acute chest pain, that's just an admission to cardiology or, or inpatient service for maybe likely uh, invasive coronary angi angiography as your next step. And these are kind of some of the CDP risk scores that would classify someone as high risk, so a hard score of 7 to 10, grade score greater than 140, TIMI 5 to 7. Um, but that's a call to, to cardiology. Francisco, there's one question in the chat about um, the the recommendation for GDMT um, and kind of clarifying, is this something that the guidelines refer to in regards to CAD um, since we traditionally think about this for like heart failure? Yeah, um, so with regards to CAD, the recommendation is for aspirin, uh, maximal statin therapy and up titrating of antianginals. That's what I gathered as uh, GDMT with regards to CAD and chest pain. Great question. Sorry, tea break, lots of talking. Okay, so let's shift gears a bit and talk about evaluating chest pain in the outpatient setting, which is also a very common uh, thing that we do. So, um, similar to the emergency department, we need to determine what the pretest probability for CAD is by using some form of risk assessment tool. So here I have the CAD consortium model, which is a really snazzy kind of new um, risk calculator. It was developed and validated based on more than 5,000 patients from 18 different hospitals all across Europe and the United States. Um, 
And as of now, the uh, current guidelines uh, in the United States recommend using something called a diamond forester. Um, oops. Uh, recommend using the diamond forester model or the do clinical score model. But as we see, there are some issues with those models. So let's take a look. So this graph kind of highlights uh, one particular point, and that is that with regards to the older models, such as the Diamond Forester model, um, it overestimates the pretest probability for CED as the uh, etiology of our patient's chest pain. And so with our current testing patterns, uh, what we're seeing is that we have a high normal coronary angiography rate. So up to 50 to 60% of patients that we're referring for invasive coronary angiography because of chest pain, who we deem our intermediate risk, their coronary angi uh, angiograms are completely normal. Um, so, you know, ultimately, because the diagnostic imaging strategy depends on our pretest probability, improving the estimate of our pretest probability will help clinicians like us make better decisions as to which diagnostic test is better. And in this case, I would say that the CAD consortium model, as we can see here, no longer overestimates uh, risk, especially in that intermediate risk category and in the high risk category. And so this should be something that is our go-to for establishing our pretest probability in the outpatient setting. And I'll go back to it and just look at some of these inputs. So really cool. It, it has a lot of different things like age, sex, chest pain. Here they classify it as typical versus atypical, which like I'm hoping they'll change that at some point. And then it even has the opportunity, say if you are if you have a coronary uh, artery calcium score for your patient, you can also input that and it refines the risk even further. So that's really cool. So what are ultimately the recommendations for low-risk patients with stable chest pain and no known history of CAD who we're seeing in clinics? So first things first, if they're low risk, um, you can defer any further diagnostic testing at that time. Other thing you could do if you feel like your patient has some risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, maybe some dyslipidemia, but they aren't on a statin therapy just quite yet, um, you could consider getting a CT calcium scoring scan. So this is something that we can order. And um, I don't think we do enough of, but uh, basically among symptomatic patients, a CAC score of zero identifies a very low risk cohort of patients who may not require any additional diagnostic testing. The other thing that that CAC score gives us is the opportunity to maybe engage in primary prevention and start statin therapy. So for example, if your CAC score is between one and 99 and you're over the age of 55, you can consider statin, uh, statin therapy. So very helpful test. And what about patients with intermediate to uh, high risk stable chest pain uh, with no known CAD? So uh, once again, a CCTA is effective for the diagnosis of CAD and for risk stratification. So clinical trials report a higher diag diagnostic sensitivity for CCTA compared with stress testing for detecting obstructive CAD. So we know that CCTA without stenosis or plaque has a low CAD event rate. And from the PROMISE trial, um, the three-year CAD event rate for negative test finding was 0.9% for CCTA versus 2.1% for stress testing. So um, not only does it give us an indication of whether there is CAD, uh, it also allows us to risk stratify our patients because we are able to look in the vessels and see what their level of uh, atherosclerotic plaque burden is and uh, CAD. So intermediate to high risk and no known CAD. Uh, once again, I bring up this diagram because it shows us that CCTA is preferred for those uh, who are aged less than 65 and not on optimal preventive therapies because it gives us a, an opportunity to, to intervene and practice some primary prevention. Um, and on the other hand, if your patient's greater than 65, then you can consider still doing a stress testing um, as the cornerstone of your initial screening exam. The interesting part is that you can also do the CCTA and then follow that up with a CTFFR to get some more information on these patients that are over the age of 65. 
Yeah. Um, so just a couple questions in the chat. Just want to yeah. pause for a second. So one um, question from Hillary was about whether or not the guidelines differentiate between patients who are having like active chest pain in clinic or who are just reporting like recent chest pain. Um, and then another question about which um, sites in our UW system perform outpatient CCTA. Great question. Um, yeah, there is. there was no distinction made between outpatient setting, whether the patient was having active chest pain in clinic. It was more so, I, I think, as a patient who is having ongoing chest pain uh, in the outpatient setting. Yeah, but they didn't clearly say uh, outpatient active chest pain in clinic. I think if you're worried enough, those patients would go to the ED and then we would we would cycle through the, the acute management of uh, chest pain in the emergency department. Cool. And then one other, sorry, just to tack on to the second question, Jordan also asked if, if we have the FFR, CTFFR um, in our system. Yeah. Um, I have to double check on if we have the CTFFR in our system. I believe we should. Um, and with regards to the CCTA, we could do those at the U and at Harborview. Any other questions? Nope, everyone just wants you to be their cards consult. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And once again, algorithms, algorithms, but uh, I will just point you to some like key nuances that have changed and have uh, kind of our practice change guidelines. Okay, so um, first things first, you have stable chest pain in the outpatient setting and you have known CAD. Um, either way you cut it, whether you have non-obstructive CAD or obstructive CAD, the first thing that you're going to think about is uh, intensifying GDMT. And we kind of alluded to that, uh, whether it's aspirin, stand therapy, or of titrating antianginals. Um, if you have persistent CAD despite that, that's when you can do the CCTA plus uh, the FFRCT that we talked about. Um, I'll need to figure out whether we have this. I'm pretty sure we do. Um, and I can get back to people on this because I want to order this at some point. Um, and if once again, if that FFR CT value is less than 0.8, um, or if there's moderate to severe ischemia, then that patient goes to invasive coronary angiography because the hope is that they have a significant uh, lesion in their coronary arteries that is causing the patient's chest pain. Um, and one thing that the guidelines really didn't do is specifically identify what moderate to severe ischemia was, but based on previous studies, that would be something like a nuclear scan with greater than 10% ischemic myocardium, an echo that has greater than three segments of ischemia, or a cardiac MR with greater than 12% uh, ischemia. So just kind of some things. And similarly with like high risk CAD, those folks would typically be uh, patients who have uh, severe three vessel CAD or left main disease greater than 50% stenosis. So um, conclusions, uh, that was a lot uh, to go through. Um, any questions before I move through the final thoughts? Can I ask one quick question? You mentioned um, using the coronary artery calcium score for low risk patients. Is that a change in the guidelines? Because my memory was that we don't usually use that test for symptomatic patients. Um, is that a kind of practice change or am I just remembering incorrectly? Yeah, that is, uh, I don't know if that's a practice change from the prior guidelines, specifically the CAC score, but as of now, if a patient is low risk and they don't have CAD, um, and they're having uh, chest pain, you can consider getting a, a CAC score to further risk stratify them. Um, the thought being that if the CAC score is zero, the likelihood of their chest pain being from CAD is like pretty much nil. And then it gives you an avenue to have a little bit more data to talk with your patient about early lifestyle interventions and possibly start st starting statin therapy pending that CAC score. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then there are a couple other questions um, in the chat. So Hillary wanted to clarify. So this means that our um, first line in outpatient stable chest pain is CCTA instead of functional stress testing. Yeah, that is that is the biggest change to these guidelines. So in Europe, they've been doing that for quite some time. We had not been doing that. 
And so that is the change uh, in paradigm is relying more on anatomical testing versus functional testing, especially because there have been several studies that show that it's non inferior and that it gives us more information to further risk stratify our patients. And I will say that that is particularly the case for patients who are intermediate risk, uh, who are in the intermediate risk category. Cool. And then one other question from Adrian about how much the validity of the CCTA is dependent on the radiologist reading them. Um, that I don't know for sure. I do know that um, they're still working out the kinks with regards to uh, availability. Sometimes the tests do come back a little bit subpar because they caught the bottom of the heart, things like that. So I think we're still working on increasing our throughput of this test. Um, but I don't know how, if the test, I don't know what classifies the test as like a good test versus like a not so good test that we otherwise can't guard our gardener too much information from. Okay, and then one more question. Sorry for so many, but these are good. Um, Rebecca was asking about for the outpatient setting about what tools to use. And she's clarifying when you're thinking through low, intermediate and high, are you using the CAD consortium model or are you using the ones we use in the ED, the heart, Timmy, Grace? Yeah, great question. So for the outpatient setting, you are using the CAD consortium model. Awesome. Okay, I think that that's all the questions for now. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for those wonderful questions. Okay. So, conclusions. Um, first one that kind of just like I don't know blew my mind. I guess because I never took the time to really think about it was uh, high sensitivity troponin uh, assays preferred, specifically called out in the guidelines, and we have it. So we're really lucky to be able to have access to this test, which will allow us to exclude. Um, something like an acute myocardial injury a lot quicker um, with a greater negative predictive value. The other thing that I think we do a great job of is using our clinical decision pathways and encourage everyone to continue to use these. And then also adopting this new nomenclature of cardiac, likely cardiac, and non-cardiac. For patients with uh, acute chest pain in the emergency department, if they're low risk based on your CDP and their troponins, it's okay to discharge without further testing, and you don't need to recommend that they have stress testing uh, thereafter. If the patient's intermediate risk, you can consider a TTE to look for new evidence of myocardial ischemia. And if you can't get that, then you can always get a CCTA, and that you should be able to get in the emergency department pretty quickly. Um, and if they're high risk, we admit. For stable chest pain in the outpatient setting, so we use that CAD consortium model, which to be honest, I didn't know about. And it, it seems like it's such a great tool. Um, and I just am hopeful that we'd be able to integrate that more into our uh, outpatient clinical practice. If no known history of CAD at intermediate risk in age less than 65, I think we should consider doing a CCTA. Uh, in, in lieu of going uh, straight to stress testing. And in no, if known history of CAD, we optimize our GDMT, which we talked about. And if symptoms persist, then that's when we consider ICA for treatment of symptoms. Um, ultimately, what I will say is that the biggest changes for these guidelines are really relying on tools to, to assess our pretest probability. Um, reliance more on functional versus, uh, I should say anatomical versus functional testing and kind of knowing when we can order these tests for our patients. And lastly, just kind of realizing that there is no direct route to invasive coronary angiography any further. Beforehand, our patients with chest pain who are intermediate risk would almost always go to invasive coronary angiography, and that's no longer the case. And so I hope that with our risk assessment tools, the use of uh, anatomical testing, we actually have the need for less invasive coronary angiography, and we're able to capture patients at an earlier stage to risk stratify them and engage in primary prevention. All right, that's it. Thanks, everyone.
Yeah, thanks, Francisco. A couple, um, one other question. Sorry. <laughs> this one's from Ben. He wanted to ask about some of the limitations of CCTA in terms of does your patient need to um, be in a regular rhythm? What does their heart rate need to be? And then if they can have like pacemakers or other metallic objects um, in terms of image quality. Yeah, I believe if the patient is paced, then a CCTA might not be the best study. Um, and the other limitations is their heart rate can't be like 110 in AFib. Yeah, you're right. Uh, they usually have to be going like maybe 60s, 70s, the highest, um, which most people are going that about that heart rate. Like no one's usually tacking away, like resting at like 90s. Um, so yeah, those are some limitations. You can't be like super tachycardic. Uh, you can't be paced, I believe. And then the other thing is you can't have a contrast allergy. So that would kind of be a bummer if your patient had a contrast allergy, especially, especially a severe one, this might not be a great avenue, in which case you could defer to stress, uh, stress testing. Awesome. And then Aisha did put a link in the um, chat for using the CID consortium um, tool. Um, so feel free to, to look at that, everyone. Thank you. Um, awesome. This was so helpful. Um, I feel like I... Um, yeah, this is definitely like practice changing and exciting. So thank you for running through all of this with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Any other questions that I missed? Awesome. So why don't we reconvene at 9.50, just a few minutes earlier than um, planned, and we'll um, hear from Duncan next.